So, Professor Graselli, um, it's a pleasure to have you again among us. Thank you very much, Fernando, and you were very right. I was here for all research and options, even before it was called research and options. And not, not sure about good mood, but I try, even on a Sunday morning like this. I thought I would start with a, with a prayer, because, you know, it's like mass, and no. Uh, so it's, it's a talk about, uh, well, it's not a talk, it's meant to be a mini course, so I'm gonna go slower. I, I presented preliminary results about this uh, last year, uh, but some people said that, you know, the subject is too vast and I went very fast and so it would be uh, appropriate to do another version more, you know, where I can discuss each of the modules because it's, uh, it involves economics, it involves uh, physics, it involves climate, so, so, and finance. So there's a lot to, to talk about Then I propose to give the mini course this year. And towards the end of the mini course, I'll present some newer results. So uh, I have many collaborators in, the, uh, in this project. It's a, it's a huge project, involves many moving parts. Uh, I started working about a year and a half on that on that specific project, but as you're going to see, it, it uh, makes reference to a lot of my previous work in macroeconomics. So, uh, as far as uh, so, the names there on the screen I tell you more or less what what uh, each group is doing. So, at McMaster, we have a group there with uh, two students, uh, Emma Holmes and Daniel Presta, and another professor, Ben Boker. Ben is cross-appointed in uh, biology and mathematics. He's a, he's an ecologist and has worked a lot. In, uh, in climate before. Uh, at uh, IFD, the Agence Française de Développement, uh, in France is the, is the French Central, uh, the French Development Bank, and uh, Gaël Giraud, the first name there in the list, is the leader of that group, he's the chief economist there at IFD, and he, he and I collaborated on another paper before, and he invited me to join what they were doing there regarding climate modeling. And uh, Etienne Devrin and Antoine Godin, uh, they, they are all uh, research economists at IFD. And then the uh, bottom line, uh, Andrea Macron we recognize, so these are the names of the uh, participants of the Financial Math uh, Team Challenge. I was there this last uh, summer in July, uh, well, summer in, nor in the Northern Hemisphere, but it was winter here, and of course was also winter in South Africa. Uh, this is this wonderful activity that Andrea and David Taylor organize there uh, every year where they divide uh, master students, local master students, plus some international students in teams, and each team has a mentor, and they compete for 10 days in trying to solve problems, and then they present as a super intense, and you're gonna see in the end what these students did uh, was, was quite impressive. Uh, unfortunately, only one group wins the challenge, but everybody has fun, and our group didn't win. I thought it should have won. But it didn't. No, I'm kidding. Uh, and, and, but you see, I, I, I thought it was really excellent work that they did, so I'm, I'm uh, including here some of their contributions as well. But uh, so Jose is at uh, UCL, and he's actually working with uh, Beatrice, who is going to be here uh, during the week. Uh, do you know what happened to the others, Andrea? Uh, Killian, I know, he's applying to for PhDs and Vegan and Nomvelo, do you know? Right, and, and Nomvelo, uh, her name means something also in, in, in her language and was related to the project, it was something like, yes. It had some, some climate connection, she told me, that was very cute, but now I cannot remember. Maybe I remember towards the end of the lecture. Anyways, so that's the team. Uh, now let's just uh, see what, what am I going to talk about. So uh, first of all, uh, what, what, are, what is the size of the risk we're talking about? So if financial mathematicians want to quantify you know, size of the markets and size of the risks. So there are three uh, fundamental risks associated with climate change. The first one is uh, physical risks. So these are just uh, actual damages caused by extreme events. For example, flooding and hurricanes and, and, and all sorts of natural disasters that increase in both uh, frequency and severity because of cr climate change. 
change. So the estimated losses in 2017 were about $300 billion, and Alliance, the insurance company, uh, estimate, made an estimate in 2018 that within the next 10 years, this is going to be averaging at about a trillion dollars per year just in losses. And these are not the, uh, you know, property and casualty, normal losses that happen uh, every day. These are exclusively losses due to uh, extreme events. So that's one big category that now, uh, in particular, the insurance company, of course, the insurance uh, industry is, of course, very interested in uh, uh, tackling and, and understanding and perhaps uh, hedging and using financial derivatives to, to deal with it. The second big uh, category of risk is what are called stranded assets. Uh, so people in the oil uh, industry would understand that very well. So these are uh, uh, both uh, existing uh, infrastructure and future revenue. So, so it's, a, it's a big deal when you're valuing a, 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 an oil company or any, uh, in, any energy uh, project to see the uh, uh, future revenue that is going to be generated that's going to tell you how much to invest and how fast to invest and so on and so forth. Uh, but it assumes that that revenue is actually going to be materialized and that the resources are actually going to be used. But, but this is a problem because, well, uh, we're going to talk later about emissions and, and, and how they contribute to climate change. We're going to present to you the entire cycle. But you know the, the story that uh, there is a carbon budget. There is a total amount of carbon that can be uh, there in the atmosphere uh, if you're going to remain below a certain target for temperature above uh, pre-industrial levels. And we already spent most of the budget. And, and, and if we are ever to, to be, so this is not hypothetical, you can measure these things, and if you are to remain below uh, a reasonable budget for, for total emissions, you just cannot develop those resources. You, there's a lot of uh, oil and gas and all sorts of other uh, uh, fossil fuels that just cannot be uh, brought up. They cannot be explored, they cannot be developed, because otherwise we're gonna be uh, uh, way above the, the carbon budget. So this these are not only existing, but future uh, revenue streams that are now uh, completely compromised. And, and this is estimated, uh, the estimates vary from a few hundred billion dollars to a very recent one came out last year from a very thorough study by this uh, collaborators they published on nature, climate change, it's about four trillion dollars total amount of stranded assets. Uh, and then lastly, there, so these are things that can be more or less measured in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, existing capital and future capital. The, the third source of risk is a little less uh, uh, direct, but uh, there is, there's obvious uh, appetite to uh, move away from uh, high intensity, high carbon intensity projects, and into uh, low carbon, into the low carbon economy. So, so that alone is a dislocation. Uh, so it means the huge portfolios, and now, uh, you know, Several countries are passing legislation. In France, this is uh, already effective, that portfolio managers, in addition to several uh, 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 characteristics of the portfolios, they have to declare the carbon risk of the portfolio. So how much of the uh, portfolio is subject to uh, you know, changes in carbon price and, and so on and so forth. So investors, and I'm talking about like mutual funds and, and, and pension funds and so on and so forth, they are becoming more and more aware that they would like to be invested and in portfolios that are not exposed to that kind of risk. They'll be exposed to the types of risk that I mentioned in the first two bullets, but now it's, it's the, the specific risk I'm talking about is the dislocation risk of moving billions of dollars from one type of, of investment to another uh, and, and have to deal with uh, you know, fixed income and interest rates and all sorts of things that come associated with it. So here's a picture of that. So these are just a number of funds, number of... Uh, uh, portfolio managers that have committed, they go ahead and sign pledges. There's a Montreal pledge, and uh, you know, there's several places that collect these things. And, and to, to commit to divest from high intensity, high carbon intensity uh, investment, and of course it's growing, and this is the amount in dollars that it's now being uh, moved, shifted away from high carbon uh, intensity uh, uh, funds. So it's, again, of the order of trillions of uh, of dollars. 
so that's the that's the landscape. Uh, this is this is a challenge for, for us financial mathematicians. Uh, there's also a, a need. There's also an opportunity uh, in terms of uh, 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 what needs to be done, and we're going to talk later, you know, what, what are abatement costs, what do, do they do to uh, emissions, and after uh, the, the entire consequence for the economic uh, uh, cycle. But, but the point is, at some crucial point in the, in the chain, there is an investment that needs to be done. And I'm not talking about financial investment, I'm talking about uh, real investment, so in terms of uh, 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 R&D and, and technology and, and actual production of green technologies. So, uh, again, estimates vary, but, but whatever it is, it's something around you know, 10%, so 5 to 15% of total infrastructure investment that goes on every year should be done in green projects. And now this is, this is not you know, just because people want to feel good and be in the green uh, uh, industry. This is now the reverse calculation is how much needs to be there if you want emissions to go down at the rate that, that scientists say that they need to go down. So, so you know, 10% of, of about $6 trillion, uh, uh, then there's adaptation costs uh, because of the, the physical damages that we've been uh, talking before. So, so you add the two things and, and you need to be spending about, you know, one trillion dollar per year. Uh, well, anywhere from 500 billion to, to 1.2 uh, 1 trillion uh, into uh, a green investment. That's what you would, the, the planet would like us to be doing. Uh, so how much are we doing? Well, it's about a third. So, I like to put orders of magnitude here because it, it, it grounds the discussion. So, on the one hand, surely more should be done because we're doing a third of what is estimated to be needed. But it's not an impossible problem either. I mean, we have had uh, other situations where investments did triple in, 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 in size, uh, uh, in particular, you know, wartime mobilizations and, and things like that. So, you know, we know how to do this. We, or we have the capacity to do this. So it's, it's a, a huge uh, uh, change. Uh, those are huge numbers, but it's not, you know, that we need to be doing a hundred times more than what we're currently doing or things like that. So, so this is doable. That's the first message for, for today. It, so we are in a, it's a precarious situation. All the figures I'm going to show you are, in a sense, uh, uh, depressing, but the, the hopeful message is that uh, uh, stuff can be done. And every body that you hear that is serious about this problem needs to tiptoe into these two uh, uh, extremes. So you hear, you know, documentaries and so on. Uh, there's the new, uh, the, the current uh, uh, version of the planet Earth from, from BBC with uh, David Attenbury. And, uh, and, you know, I watched that, of course, I liked the, that kind of stuff. And, and the entire message is like, it starts with a, with a, you know, terrible thing. So this entire ecosystem is collapsing. But look! If we just do this and let it flourish, and then, you know, there's, there's something better that happens. So, so it, because otherwise you, you lose people on, on, on uh, 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 despair, right? So, so you cannot just say that there's nothing that cannot, can be done because then uh, we, you throw the towel. So, so I'm going to present the exact same message that uh, uh, it's important, it's a challenge, it's, it's very real, it's very dangerous, but it's doable, eminently doable, and finance and financial math can uh, contribute to that challenge, okay? So, so these are numbers uh, slightly outdated, so 2015, 2016, because uh, it's difficult to, to compute all those things, but you can, you can see what, what the trend is. But this is uh, the, what I was saying, the total annual investment in green technologies of the order of, you know, 400, 500, 600 billion, where it should be of the order of maybe three times more than that, okay? Uh, and, and, and that's done uh, both uh, more or less equally between the private sector and the public sector. And I'm going to use this kind of rough figures later in the modeling when I'm going to model uh, public subsidies into, into a microeconomic model that does uh, that type of investment. And we're going to see that we're going to put about 50% of public subsidies because that's more or less what's, what's going on. 
Uh, and and you, you know the public stuff is is primarily through development banks like IFD, uh, but also through uh, direct uh, investment, direct uh, uh, governments just doing and uh, you know buying power plants and, and refurbishing them and so on and so forth. And then there's a lot of private investment that goes into retrofitting and. Uh, R&D in, in green technologies, and, and, and then that's the part where there's a lot of room to, to increase the flow of investment towards that, making it more uh, widespread, easily understandable, easily verifiable, and available for anybody who would like to invest in this. So one a particular instrument that we're going to be talking about later are green bonds. Uh, we're going to define what they are later and, and see their impact, but, but this is the uh, issuance of green bonds, uh, annual issuance. So it started very low, like around $30 billion a year. Now it's, uh, last year was uh, uh, over $150 billion. And this is still a drop in the bucket compared to total issuance of, of bonds, regular bonds uh, that happen every year. It's about, you know, more than 10 times uh, that figure. But it's getting there. It's, it's, it's increasing. So, so what is a green bond? Just, just anticipation. It's just a, 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 it's a bond that a company says that uh, if, if they sell the the bond, the revenue that is generated from the bond sale is going to be used in a project that reduces emissions. Uh, now, there's a lot that goes on in the background, so what qualifies as a green bond? Uh, so, so this is one of the good outcomes of the emissions trading mechanism that was in place in Europe for, for, for uh, carbon pricing. Uh, it, it, it didn't quite work in terms of carbon pricing. There was too many uh, allowances. Uh, the prices were too low to be uh, biding. But what they did do was to create certification processes, uh, very uh, uh, transparent and effective certification processes to see when uh, these uh, emissions uh, certificates could be traded. And that same certification process can be used. Hello, Jorge, how are you? Greetings. <laughs> Greetings. Greetings and salutations. Uh, uh, that, that framework can effectively be used to uh, certify projects that then can be labeled as uh, uh, green projects that can receive funding from green bonds. Uh, very well. So, uh, this was by way of introduction, and, and you already saw from, from the things that I mentioned that this uh, touches in many areas of, of uh, uh, the, the economy. So, it, it's not going to be a problem that is, uh, you know, you, can only, you, you might only understand one segment, real estate, or insurance, or energy. No, this has to be something that brings the entire economy together. So, it has to be an integrated model. So, this, uh, uh, the name that economists give for this are integrated IAMs, integrated assessment models. And, and they, the, the goal is to integrate what with what? It's to integrate the climate, module, climate modeling with uh, uh, economic modeling. Now, this can be done in many ways. There's a long history, but maybe uh, uh, every history should start, and I mentioned that last year, so here I'm going to go in a bit more detail. Every history should start with this uh, uh, influential study called The Limits of Growth, uh, was published in 1972 by this uh, think tank, the Club of, uh, Club of Rome. And uh, so what they did, so this was the you know, early days of uh, uh, large-scale computer simulations with uh, early supercomputers, uh, primarily at MIT, uh, with people like Jim Forrester, uh, systems dynamics. And, and the idea here is to put you know, reasonable degrees of complication, but not too complicated, uh, in, in, in many parts of the economy and see what the inflows and outflows are. So there's a big uh, matrix, input-output matrices, and, and, and then put it all together in a sort of computationally intensive way and simulate and see what the, what the scenarios are. And the motivation for that was uh, uh, primarily going from 
the economy to the environment. So the arrow of causality here is uh, consider the economy as it is and don't change too much in the economy and see how it impacts the environment, uh, mostly about depletion of resources. That was one of the key variables that they were talking about. And then seeing when some natural resources are depleted, of course, there's a feedback in the economy, but, but it's not like uh, it's, it's only you, you know, after b many bad things happen to the environment that the economy starts to suffer. Uh, and, and, and we're going to see some examples of diagrams of the type of interactions that they're looking at, but their message was similar to what I just said about five minutes ago. Uh, you do nothing, there is a high chance of a catastrophic outcome. And I say, if you do business as usual, this would lead to sudden and uncontrollable decline in population and industrial capacity within the next 100 years. And that was in 1972. And that's almost 50 years ago. So we're almost halfway through what they were saying. So within the 100 years could happen very, very soon. Uh, but, but there's the optimist part. So it's always the pessimist and the optimist side of this story. The optimist is uh, it's not uh, uh, inevitable. So you could do changes. And in particular, they concentrated, because they're all MIT geeks, they concentrated on technology changes. So, so you know, carbon sequestration and this and that. And, and then they show simulated results where that uh, outcome with sudden contraction of population and, and economic uh, productivity could be avoided. Now. As I mentioned last year, uh, you know you are doing something right when you are equally criticized from the left and the right. <laughs> okay? And these limits of growth got vicious criticism from, from all over. Uh, because So it was from, from economists, from the industry. The Catholic Church criticized it. <laughs> and, and so you, you can parse the arguments, but, but it's really that, you know, they were, they were proposing something radical, that is, you need to think about the consequences of whatever uh, policies you're implementing. And neither the left or the right wanted to hear that. Uh, the, the left uh, criticized saying, oh, this is an excuse not to uh, uh, grow and not to redistribute income. So, so it's an excuse to, to just, you know, conserve the things, because a lot of uh, uh, environmental conservation uh, means, you know, not doing things. And, and if you are from, from a point of view that there's a lot of wrong things in income and, and, and labor distribution around the world, you would like to actively uh, 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 correct that. So, so they say, well, this is an excuse not to do it, uh, therefore we are going to attack it. And from the right, well, uh, you cannot, uh, you, you don't have to be too imaginative to see why they didn't like. This would be oil companies and, and, and high uh, uh, profile energy companies that didn't like to hear the idea that if they continue what they were doing, their resources are going to be depleted and their share prices are going to uh, drop within the next hundred years along with the rest of the world, but the share price is what uh, concerned them the most. Right? It's like, no, I'm not going to make that joke. Uh, so here are some, some examples. Uh, so they start with small building blocks, and if you are from a kind of a, a then what later became an agent-based model and, and, and dynamical systems couple with agent-based models, you're going to recognize this type of thing. So you look at, uh, you know, what goes into the population. Well, there's birth, there's death. So that's the mortality, fertility. So that's the population uh, cycle. Uh, now, what, what is the industry cycle? Well, investment is the stuff that creates uh, capacity, so in economic terms, not investment in financial terms. Economic investment is just an increase in capital. Uh, and, but then there's depreciation. Depreciation uh, makes capital go down, and, and then the, t the evolution of capital in time is the, the balance between investment and depreciation, just like the evolution in population is the balance between uh, fertility and mortality. So, so, so far, so good, simple enough, but now you start putting more arrows into this stuff. Uh, so, this now is not that easy anymore because now, you know, population requires food, 
uh, the, po the pollution is going to affect mortality, so you can uh, increase the rate of mortality if, more, if, if the, the air is polluted. Uh, well, you, you know, industrial output, so investment affects both uh, industrial capital and agricultural uh, capital, uh, but then also, uh, you know, as you increase the capacity of your plants, they're going to be emitting more, there's going to be more uh, uh, industrial emissions that feeds into the uh, environment, that feeds into the mortality rate. So you see that even those two very simple blocks, if you think them completely separated, they're just simple. Well, what is population increases? Fertility minus mortality. What's capital increases? Investment minus depreciation. But now immediately put a link through emissions and you see that there's, there's more, there are more feedbacks in there. So that's the, that's the kind of a spirit of this modeling and you're going to see that coming back later with more modern approaches that, that we're using. Uh, so, and then they said, okay, let's continue and let's put more. <laughs> so separate now the industrial production from production of uh, consumer goods and capital goods and, and keep you know, adding blocks until you have some degree of complexity that resembles more or less what you think the economy is doing. And they end up with something like that, <laughs> right? So now, uh, of course, you cannot read what it is, but, uh, but if you zoom out on the page in each of those things, individually, Individually, they have the flavor of the blocks that I was just talking to you about. So there's nothing uh, extremely, uh, uh, you know, mysterious about it. But it's just the, the economy is composed of many of those modules and the interactions are non-trivial and you need some uh, level of sophistication to put them together. Uh, and, and, and they didn't try to do this analytically at all. They just uh, fed it to their supercomputers and they obtained simulations like that. So, so uh, many of the lines, uh, I cannot remember what they are, but for example, this is the level of pollution, right? So pollution increases uh, up to a turning point where it starts to decrease because the economy starts to tank, because then there is no emissions going on anymore, because uh, uh, that's the beginning of the collapse of the economy. Uh, but that, that happens about the same time as the, the population decreases, and the population decreases for similar, similar factors. And, they, and they're both connected, so this turning points here, they're both connected with this sort of steep decline in natural resources. Uh, and industrial output is the thing that peaks first and then declines. It declines before pollution because, of course, there's a delay in the emissions from, from uh, outcome. So before, the first thing that happens is the economy tanks and then uh, some years later the level of pollution starts to decrease again. Uh, what is absent, so you see it's already kind of a sophisticated view of, of what's going on and I think these other lines are for specific uh, factors of production, but what is absent there are economic variables other than uh, industrial output. So it, it was mostly a, a well-developed uh, physical model of, of, of the climate with a simplified economic model and we're going to address that in a, in a bit. Uh, now, current integrated assessment models, they, they decided to do the opposite, to concentrate more on the economic side and, and how, uh, so it's, it's the impact of climate, what am I doing here? Uh, Yes, because I said before, the, the MIT models, they assumed that the economy was doing something and only fed into the climate, and, and then they run the climate model for a long time, and, and it's only after the climate collapses that the economy uh, uh, feels anything. Now, uh, uh, what was uh, criticized by the economists was that this is nonsense, right? Because economic agents are rational agents, they anticipate things, they make optimal decisions, they, they, they uh, you, you know, have a budget constraint and all sorts of things that we learn in, in economics. So they are not going to just do things, screw up the climate, wait a hundred years and then see what can be done. So they're going to be actively changing. So this uh, uh, more sophisticated models uh, want to look at the optimized, from the, an optimal uh, economic agent point of view, how they're going to be modifying their decisions based on what's happening with the climate. So climate, how it uh, impacts the economy. Uh, so the, the most famous one is uh, DICE, it's a called Dynamic Integrated Climate Economic Model, and it was developed by uh, Nordhaus in, in the 90s, and Nordhaus just won the Nobel Prize uh, 
not this year, the year before in economics. Uh, by the way, uh, I don't know if you heard, but so I'm going to mention later uh, uh, some other climate economists, uh, uh, Weizmann, that uh, people say should have given the Nobel Prize together with Nordhaus because he, uh, uh, well, for one thing, they had uh, divergent views. You're going to see how in the discount functions and the, and the damage functions. Uh, but, but Weizmann really had a more sort of a sophisticated view of, of what tipping points were, and Nordhaus was more the sort of, uh, let's just do the optimal rate of carbon consumption and, and see what happens. And, and uh, so, so this was a, another case of a, a kind of a stolen prize, and, and Weizmann just uh, killed himself a few months ago, so this after the Nobel Prize it was not awarded to him, so it's a kind of a tragic end of, a tragic note to that story. Uh, anyways, uh, the entire model here from the economic point of view is essentially a uh, uh, neoclassical uh, dynamic stochastic gender equilibrium model. So it, it's, it's the same way to do macroeconomics that was behind models that central banks use, uh, models that uh, you, you know, the IMF uses. So it's, it's, it's really just uh, modeling uh, uh, the entire household sector as a representative agent, the entire firm sector as a representative firm, the entire banking sector as a representative bank, and each of them uh, has a utility function or firms that are optimizing profits, and, and there is a, a, a market that clears and, and they optimize their allocation, uh, and, 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 and everybody is, is happy with that. And we're going to see some of the elements of that type of modeling uh, coming into play. Uh, so that's what I say there. It's based on welfare maximization, gender equilibrium, uh, partial equilibrium, cost minimizations, and so on. So in particular, in the production side, it uses this Cobb-Douglas uh, 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 Technology uh, and and uh, this you know agents optimize with uh, infinite foresight and one thing in that came as a criticism after the financial crisis is that this type of models they cannot possibly give you any uh, prediction of an economic collapse because they uh, 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 assume that they don't exist because <laughs> if you have three or four years late. Uh, so, so they are stochastic in the sense that uh, uh, there's a core deterministic model uh, that follows an exponential growth, and then it's shocked periodically by, uh, by random uh, disturbances, and those random disturbances are not meant to be, uh, they are exogenous shocks, uh, and they are of the top type of technology shocks or information shocks or uh, changes in preferences and, and things like that. So, so these are the things that uh, in business cycle theory, it's the real business cycle that, uh, you, you, you know, the only shocks that actually matter in the economy are shocks of, of a real nature in terms of, you, you know, there's a new iPad and people don't know what to do with the iPad, so that disturbs the technology and until people adjust to that, uh, some, some uh, dislocation happens in the economy. And, uh, and so, so, of course, that has been uh, criticized to death because this type of theory is essentially uh, um, uh, stable and, and they, they assume strong conditions for stability, and then this shocks, the, all that they do is deviate a little bit from this equilibrium path, and, and, and we're gonna see in some examples later, if they deviate too much, uh, then that's discarded as an impossible path because it, uh, it doesn't satisfy a transversality condition and a rational agent would not follow that path. So there's a strong assumption that you're gonna be going back to the uh, uh, exponential growth equilibrium and only be disturbed from, from time to time. Does that answer your, your question? And, and, and then you can model into the shocks the kind of seasonality that you want, you know, how, how long the cycles are gonna be, but the shocks are all uh, um, arbitrary and, and, and you actually don't observe those shocks, you need to then calibrate the shocks and the shocks all have, and, and, and first of all, there's no, num no limit in the number of shocks that you can put there, so any modeler can invent, oh, I think this is because of a whatever, whatever shock, 
oh, let's see how it works. Oh, it has a, a variance because they all have zero mean because they're unbiased shocks. Oh, it has a variance. Let's calibrate the variance. And then they find the variance based on the fluctuations of economic variables. So now there's a match, there's a, a moment match, and, and, and they're happy because there's a shock that they didn't know what it was that explains something that, that they're seeing. And, and so the entire methodology is, is, in my view, a bit suspicious. And in particular, from the point of view of, uh, of uh, estimation or calibration, it's, uh, it's what we're used to see also in financial math. They calibrate all these things and then a month later they calibrate again and the values are all different and a month later they calibrate again and the values are all different. And, and these are meant to be fundamental shocks that, that kind of uh, you, you know, govern the evolution of the system for 100 years. So you, make a, you, you assume that the model is valid for 100 years, you do this the transversality conditions and, and, and whatnot, and then a month later you say, no, no, that model <laughs> that, that was not true. Here is the new model, and then you do it again for another 100 years. So this is what uh, Chris Rogers, in fact, in this conference, he called the uh, uh, great calibration hoax. The great calibration hoax works in finance, but works just as well in uh, macroeconomics. Very well. Uh, and in particular, these models play an absolutely uh, 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 enormous uh, they put an absolutely enormous uh, role into the discount rate because all the decisions need to, what agents do, this maximizing agents, they're discounting revenues and they're discounting losses to the present time and they need to decide you know, what, is, what is larger in order to decide if a project is worth doing or not, if a policy is worth doing or not. And, and then you get into these issues of uh, you know, which discount rate do you use, if, it, if it's an exponential uh, discount function or a hyperbolic discount function functions and the issues of time consistency and, and, and you know, uh, industries of, of papers uh, created around that. And, uh, but that, it's because by design, the whole model is designed to do this sort of optimization at the present time and all the decisions need to be based on this discounting values. Yes, George. A little bit along the lines of the question that uh, Lane just asked, yeah. uh, have people tried uh, mean field game models and agent-based models? On no, so agent-based models, yes. Uh, uh, there's a, a very influential group in Oxford doing that in, at, at INET. Uh, mean field games, not yet. So it's an it's a unexplored territory for mean field games. So if there are mean field games specialists in the audience, they, they can try that. Uh, very well. So this is what I wanted to tell you about this transversality condition uh, in, in, in economics. So I say it's a detour uh, because it's important to understand this detour because it's behind a lot of the discussion in, in macroeconomics and, and it's one of the reasons why I think this type of methodology is incompatible with what you have to do with climate change. So this came up, you know, this was the heydays of uh, real business cycles and, and a rejection to Keynesian economics. So these are the Chicago school people, uh, you know, Sargent won a Nobel Prize, Wallace didn't, but, but it's, they are in that school, like the Milton Friedman and, 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 and Chicago business school type of, uh, of, uh, of thinking. Uh, so in 1973, they have this influential paper where they are doing all this modeling uh, uh, with the rational agent and so on, and at some point there is an equation that pops up for prices. Okay, so P is the log of prices, and then there's, they deduce from first principles that that equation should be true. And where this is the money supply, you see? And now this is a, is a negative constant by assumption in the model also from first principles. Now, see what happens here. If there's a shock in the money supply, positive shock, okay, the money supply goes up in this model. This is negative. What happens to P dot? It's negative. So what happens to P? The money supply goes up and P goes to zero. So that's counterintuitive. And, and vice versa, the money supply contracts and prices start to, 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 to move up indefinitely. So they say, they, they, this was a puzzle, right? They said, hmm, crap. <laughs> so, so, you know, one possibility would to get the model and throw it away. <laughs> you see, there's a, a detour inside the detour. You know the joke of uh, uh, a president of the university trying to decide what's the cheapest department to run at the university, you know that? They, uh, everybody thought it was gonna be mathematics because all we need is a pen, uh, paper, and a garbage can, 
right? Philosophy is cheaper because they can get away without the garbage can. <laughs> so a similar note applies here. So this, at that point, they could have uh, trashed the model, but they said, no, there's something more fundamental that happens here. You see, what happens is that agents will anticipate that this price going to zero is nonsensical because after all, the money supply went up. And what we want for when the money supply goes up is that prices go up. So these agents will see that that solution doesn't satisfy the transversality condition, the correct transversality condition. And they will immediately adjust their expectations about prices. So this is about inflation expectation. They will immediately adjust their expectations and instantaneously make the price jump up by the same amount that the money supply went up because that's the only way that we'll now maintain a stable rate of inflation. Money supply goes up, the M in there, the level of P has to go up by the same amount so that M minus P uh, uh, remains the same, okay? And, and, and there is no counterintuitive decline. So this is, the, <laughs> this is a fundamental trick that they're playing here. To prevent this uh, counterintuitive outcome, all of the agents, or in particular this one representative agent in the model, decides, because they are rational, to adjust the expectations about prices to prevent the counterintuitive uh, result. So prices go up in the way that they should. So for that paper, it's, it's fine, because this is, after all, it's all deduced about expectations and contracts and so on. And, and inflation expectations are things that can jump like that. I can decide by opening the newspaper and seeing what central banks are doing, I can say, oh, okay, I'm going to change my expectation about prices, and that solves the model, that solves the problem in the model. But the problem is that now people forgot that paper, forgot the original paper, and they say, ah, we are using the jump variable technique, that if there is a change like that, that leads to a solution that it's uh, uh, violating a transversality condition, regardless of what the transversality condition is, all that you have to do is make the variables jump to adjust to that and prevent this uh, catastrophic outcome. So now, when they couple that to climate, it's the same thing, not to worry. There is a solution that implies an infinite increase in temperature, that's counterintuitive. Surely we're not gonna see that. Let's adjust all our variables. Except that the variables now for the climate, they are not expectation variables. They are actual production variables. They have delays. They have disequilibrium. They have mismatches. So, so it's an entirely uh, orthogonal type of, of, of methodology. You have some instantaneously adjusting optimal agents, rational agents, that were designed, the methodology was designed for things like interest rates, inflation rates, uh, 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 returns on investment, all these things that could be automatically adjusted. And then it's transported to a physical model where you, that doesn't apply to the variables that you have in, in your model. So this is my uh, methodological uh, detour. The second one is related to that. It's, it's, it's about this uh, saddle path uh, stability now becoming, I already said that, so this just puts in more explicit words, it becomes a condition to determine what uh, 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 solutions are valid. It's a determinacy condition. And, and if it doesn't satisfy that, so if it's away from the saddle path equilibrium, then you discard, okay? And, and I have given some talks to economists where there's invariably a DSG economist in the audience and I'm showing my other models and then I have some explosive variables and they say, oh, but we know since the 70s that those explosive paths, they cannot occur. I said, you know that they cannot occur? Yes, 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 they don't satisfy the transversality condition. So you assume that they cannot occur. You assume that they cannot occur, and therefore you know that they cannot occur. That's, that's how, how it goes, okay? Uh, all right, so end of detour. Now I'm gonna do a, a comparison between uh, the uh, unsophisticated, uh, throw it all in the computer based on little modules. Yes? Yes. If it's relevant, uh, I, I'm not clear at all what's the transversality condition. Huh? 
I'm not clear at all what you mean by the transversality condition. If you need it more in the, in the, in the mini course. No, I'm not going to need okay. it more. This is really a, a detour. But it's essentially that, you know, there is a variable that doesn't explode to infinity, and it's a state variable of the, of the system, and it, it remains in the saddle path uh, equilibrium. That's right. That's correct. Uh, so what I was saying? Yes, that uh, I'm going to do a comparison between the uh, uh, straightforward, uh, based on systems dynamics, little uh, input rates, output rates, throw it all in the computer type of model, which was the limit to growth there. Uh, so, so this is when the book was published. Okay, 1972. Uh, that was the path that they have up to them. I think this is for, what is the, what am I doing? Oh, uh, food per capita, yeah, that's right. And, and this is industrial production per capita, okay? But whatever it is, that uh, gray path is the path that was observed. And then you have a bunch of things. So, so in particular, you know, limit to growth, remember they had this uh, business as usual that they call the standard run. So what would happen? So the green is what they predicted would happen if you, let, if you did no changes in behavior or technology. And remember they said there's gonna be a point somewhere in the next century where there's gonna be a catastrophic uh, downturn, okay? And then they also made other predictions because remember they are optimistic. So, so if, you, if you use some comprehensive technology change, then you could have uh, uh, you know, many, many more years of indefinite uh, growth and, and this decline would happen at a much later time and at a much later, higher level. Uh, this could be, a, you could even stabilize and then do like this and, and it would be the best of both worlds. Okay, so, but the question you need to ask, okay, this was 50 years ago, what happened? <laughs> So this guy, Turner, published in 2008, 10 years ago, and that's the path that actually happened, the observed data after 72. That's the, the purple ones. So this one is already impressively close to the standard run, but this one is absurdly close to the standard run. Okay? So there was something to the naive model, and in particular there was something to doing nothing because nothing was done <laughs> from 72 to 2008. So that was this thunder run. We have been doing the business as usual, more or less, okay? And, and the conclusion from Turner is that in 2008, we had wasted uh, 40 years of this and we should have paid more attention to what they were saying and we could have tried to change that trajectory uh, earlier. So that's one type of comparison. Another comparison that you can make is, so what is the competitor model? Is this uh, Nordhaus model, this DICE model that uses sophisticated utility optimizing uh, Cobb-Douglas production function agents, so on and so forth. So this is the thing that was trashed. There's the thing that was, uh, you know, attacked by everybody and discredited. In its place, when climate change began to, to look like a real problem, economists replaced it with a sophisticated model that was the DICE model. Okay, now the DICE model was proposed in the 90s, so you cannot run it for 40 years in the past, or for 40 years from the future, from 90, to, to see what happened. But what you can do, because it's a model after all, you can apply the same methodology of the model to past data. So you can do back testing to the model. So you can go to 1920, okay? And, and, and then now here, do your calibration of the uh, DICE model. Uh, so this is for total factor productivity. It's one of these uh, unobserved shocks that you can have. It's a, it's a factor that comes out in front of the production function and is completely uh, uh, fictitious. It's, it's put there just to calibrate the model. Uh, but anyways, even the fictitious factor had a band in which it was supposed to evolve. This is the 95% confidence. Uh, and, and the realized value was completely outside the band. Now, this is even worse. This is for actual GDP. So that's the, the, the own, their own prediction of their own made-up factors, okay? Kind of worked for, for a while, but it's out of the band. Now, the prediction for the actual GDP, that's where it should go, and this is what the realized value of GDP was. So, so Compare that to the uh, type of success that the limits to growth model had, and it's clear which one is more grounded in actual reality, and which should tell you also which one economists chose. They chose the one that is not grounded in, in, in reality. They chose the, uh, the DICE model and gave a Nobel Prize to Nordhaus. 
Uh, so this was all my long introduction that in the, in the last year I didn't put any, you know, a third of what was there, but I wanted to explore more. And now I'm gonna go to the type of models that I really like to be doing. Uh, so this is a three hour course, we did one hour. Let's do another 20 minutes of intro to this type of modeling and then, and then a break and then we'll just show you results for the type of models that I like to be doing. Does that work? Is that okay, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, so, the models that I like go under uh, this uh, umbrella of stock flow consistent models. They are models that do not use uh, um, infinite foresight representative agents. They use sectors, and sectors are not then summarized by a uh, utility optimizing individual. They are heterogeneous sectors. Uh, we can model them with like an agent based model where each agent has their individual uh, goals and they're going to be local goals. They're not going to be infinite foresight type of goals. So you can do that computationally, but you can also do more phenomenologically, uh, saying that there are functions that uh, uh, the entire sector. Uh, uh, ends up using, and they are, they are kind of uh, aggregate functions. So for example, uh, we're gonna see later, uh, investment as a function of profits. Now each company has their own thresholds for when they're seeing their profit and how they're gonna start investing and how they're gonna stop investing. But in the aggregate, when you put the whole sector together, the uh, response of uh, investment to profits is much more uh, deterministic and, and it's much more uh, smooth than the response that each of the companies are doing. And that's the type of thing that I want to do, is, is the aggregation. So Alan Kerman, also, I didn't tell that story last time, but I can tell now because we have lots of time. Uh, Alan Kerman uh, uh, is an economist and he uh, worked most of his life on hardcore general equilibrium results. There's a book with Hildebrand on general equilibrium. So it's like a, a high bishop of, of, of you know, neoclassical economics. Until he saw the light and saw that it was all garbage, and then he started doing, as, as a second career as an economist, much more interesting work on, on complexity in economics. So, so he has this fantastic book you should go and buy called Complexity Economics, and where he describes in particular some work that he's done with uh, Hans Vollmer and, and Uli Horst. So they did some, you know, agent and, and, and interaction agents, uh, uh, mathematical models that are way more sophisticated than a lot of what uh, economists do. Uh, but, but Alan has this uh, explanation in his book. He also studied a lot of actual markets, like he goes to see observing people in, uh, you know, mar farmers markets and how they behave, but also uh, animal behavior. So he, he went all the way down to study uh, complexity in the behavior of, uh, you know, colonies of, of, for example, ants or bees. Okay, and, and he has this, this parable that should be in the back of your mind when you read these uh, uh, aggregate models. Uh, how to model a beehive, okay? So a beehive uh, is, is a fantastic uh, complex uh, uh, system that remains at more or less constant temperature because if it's not a constant temperature, you cannot make honey. Honey goes bad if it's not a constant temperature, okay? And so, so the, the, if the environment goes up in temperature, the bees need to cool the hive, all right? So, so how would an economist model this? An economist would say, aha, let us model a representative bee that flaps their wings. And as the temperature goes up, the bee flaps the wings at a higher speed, and as the temperature goes down, they flaps the wings at a lower speed. That's what the representative B is doing. Let's calibrate. Ah, it works. Then you videotape bees, and he did it. You videotape them and look at what the individual bees are doing. And, and what the bees are doing are they're either doing absolutely nothing or they are flapping at maximum speed. They only have, it's kind of an on-off, right? It's a bang-bang solution for their optimization problem. So how do they maintain the temperature constant? It's because there's heterogeneity in the population of the bees. There's a genetically different threshold for temperature in each bee. And as the temperature increases, more bees start flapping their wings. And the effect of more bees flapping at maximum speed mimics the effect of a representative bee increasing the speed of the wings. 
So that's the type of thing that I, that I want you to, to pay attention to. So individual firms are going to have complicated genetically, and genetically in this terms on the DNA of the company, genetically programmed thresholds for when to invest, and their decisions are going to be extremely simple. Nobody that I ever met in an industrial environment is doing an optimization problem. Nobody. Rene Aid is going to tell you later that there's a complicated BSDE that is being solved. You ask him if he actually knows people in industry solving a BSD like that. The solutions are extremely simple, but the aggregate behavior of those simple solutions mimic a sophisticated behavior for, for the collection, okay? And that's what we're gonna be uh, doing here. So with that as a background, uh, what we're gonna do is separate the economy into sectors. So there is a household sector. And what does the household sector do? Well, the household sector primarily uh, works for the firm sector in exchange of wages. That's the primary relationship between households and firms. Uh, now they get wages, and what do they do with the wages is to consume. And consume means that they are gonna be paying something to the firm, so already there, there's a little cycle. But the cycle is not uh, 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 perfect because they're not gonna be consuming all of their wages because for one thing, they receive more than wages, they receive interest if they have deposits on a bank, and they receive dividends from the firms if part of the households are the owners of the firms. So it's not only from wages that they consume, but also they don't consume all of this. So they receive wages, they receive dividends, they receive interest on deposits, and they either consume more or less than that. If they consume more than that, then they have to borrow, and we're not putting that here in this model because households are not the key uh, uh, sector that I want to concentrate. So let's assume they're not borrowing. If you really want the households to borrow, we can talk more. I can explain how, how that can happen. Uh, but, but primarily, if they don't borrow, if they are consuming less than what they, their income is, then they save. So this is the savings of the households, and they save by increasing either their deposit account or by buying more shares of banks and uh, firms. Okay, that's what households do. What do firms do? Well, firms, they produce stuff. So that's the output, that's GDP. They produce stuff that is bought by households in form of consumption goods, but it's also bought by the firm sector itself. So that's why I need to separate in two accounts there. So some firms buy capital goods from other firms. If I'm aggregating the firm sector, I need to have a capital account and I need to have the current account of the firms. So here they sell products to households, they get income from households, they sell products to the firm sector itself, they get income from the firm sector. This whole thing here is the income of the firm sector, which is equal to GDP in this model. And then what do they do with that income? They pay wages, they pay interest on the debt that they have with the banks, and they receive interest on uh, the deposits that they have, uh, uh, they have a bank uh, bank account for firms, they also receive interest. And, and part of the uh, profits they distribute to uh, households as dividends. Okay, so similar story. There can be more income than uh, what they're spending, but typically it's less income than what they're spending. In, I'm assuming that the typical situation is that households spend less than their income so they save, and firms spend more than their profits so they borrow. But they borrow through the banking sector, not directly from households. So if all of this, if in the end, their profits is less than what they are spending in investment and in dividends, then they need to borrow. So they increase their amount of liabilities, the amount of loans with the bank. Or they sell shares to the households. Clear what firms are doing? Because it's a mini course and not a talk, you can interrupt if any of those terms don't make sense, right? So. So that's what households do, that's what firms do. What do banks do? Banks play a very passive role in here in the sense that they don't deny. So I have a new model where we're doing uh, credit rationing and, and default and things like that. But this is a, uh, you, you know, a macroeconomic model. It's, a, it's an aggregate bank. The bank is not gonna default. In a different model, I have a network of banks. But this is just an aggregate bank. And this aggregate bank collects uh, uh, lo uh, interest from the loans, pays interest on the deposits, whatever is left is a profit, part of the profit they distribute to the households that are the owners of the banks. Some of the households are the owners of the banks. 
Uh, so that's it, those are the three sectors that are there. There should be another sector that is, so because this I got from one of the papers that I'm gonna discuss from the IFD, they don't model explicitly the government sector, but now I have a model for the government sector, that's what I'm gonna be talking about during the conference, which then will have a fiscal and a, and a monetary policy. But you should imagine here that there is another sector that uh, for the purpose of this model is very simple. They are trying to, to keep a balanced budget, but they are doing, they are gonna be collecting carbon taxes and they're gonna be uh, doing uh, subsidies into, into green technology. But because it's revenue neutral, for the purpose of this model, is not put in that table because they don't accumulate debt and they don't, they don't accumulate uh, uh, wealth, okay? So there will be a government sector there. In my talk during the conference, there will be a government sector that is much more active and is gonna have you know, a lot of fluctuation in their level of debt. This government sector is gonna to try to promise to voters that it's entirely revenue neutral. Yes, they will collect carbon taxes, but they will use all the carbon taxes to pay for subsidies in, in green projects. And then what comes below the line here is just the, the accounting relationships. Now, if some accounts go up, some other accounts need to go down, and, and, and they need to satisfy uh, consistencies that, you know, no money disappears and no money is created. So when you add them all together, you end up with uh, several uh, couple differential equations. So... Before that, yes. So you can see there are little little dots in there. These are the changes in deposits, the changes in loans, and the idea is that uh, uh, you know things have to add to zero horizontally, and things have to add to a certain amount vertically that then gets distributed into those other accounts. So this creates two types of couples between these differential equations. So it's a highly constrained system, and we're going to see later how it. it, it, it turns into differential equations. But what I claim is that this is exactly the type of, this is now a compatible methodology with uh, climate change. Remember I said that the jump variable and the you know, saddle path and predicting what the future is gonna be with perfect foresight is not what the climate is doing. The climate has differential equations as we're gonna see for carbon cycle, for emissions, for uh, you know, uh, 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 carbon sensitivities and, and, and so on and so forth that are of the form of these equations. They are disequilibrium, slow variable, uh, slowly adjusting uh, variables. And, and so now what I want is to have an economic model that has the same type of methodology because then I can just have a larger dynamical system that models both the uh, economy and the climate. Okay, uh, but before we go to the equations, let's put some variables there. I don't want you to memorize all the variables, but there are some that I do want you to memorize. So, so one is why. So if you're gonna be paying attention to something, pay attention to why. And because why is GDP. So if you're an economist, you're familiar with using why as GDP. I don't know why. It's like in Calvin and Hobbes, you know, uh, Hobbes uh, turns to Calvin and says, okay, well, let's uh, help you with your homework. First call this variable why. Why? I don't know, it's just, just call it. Anyways, uh, so, so why is GDP? And, and the first thing to realize here about why is that it appears twice. So uh, there's why zero, which is potential GDP. So this is what you would produce uh, with your capital if you're just using a simple uh, you know, capital to output ratio. You have some amount of capital, it spills out a multiple of that in terms of GDP. And this is a stable relationship. Your PKT, for example, uh, uh, analyzes this over many, many uh, decades and, and a couple of centuries. And, and it's, a, it's a slightly increasing thing, but it's, it's, it's very stable, much more stable than any of the other variables that in the SGE, the economists try to estimate. But, but for making things absolutely simple, pretend that this is a constant capital to output ratio. So in the absence of everything else, the economy was going to be producing a multiple of the capital. So, so typically new is uh, three. So if you have, uh, uh, yes, that's right. You produce one third of the total installed capital. Right? Or put another way, the total wealth, the total capital in an economy is uh, three times larger than the income of the economy in one year. Now do that for the countries that you know and you're gonna see that it's more or less like that. This doesn't change too much. It's like two for some countries, four for another countries, but it varies in that, in, in that neighborhood. Okay, so pretend that new is constant. So you have some install capacity that will be changing in time and the the production is gonna be just a, a fraction of that, 
a multiple of that, okay? Except that it's not, because it's gonna be uh, modified by two terms. So first, because you want to prevent the effects of climate change, and all this is gonna come together in the end, uh, you're gonna spend some of the uh, output not to be sold, you're gonna spend it to retrofit existing capital in, to make that more emissions uh, efficient. So that's an abatement cost, okay? So you're gonna have some amount of cost that it's not sold, so you don't make profits or that. So the firms are producing things, but some of it is kept inside the firm sector itself, so it's a cost for the firm sector to, to abate, to retrofit, to make, to ameliorate uh, the, the total emissions of the economy. So without abatement costs, your, your output would be Y0, but there's some abatement, so what you're left with is one minus A. And what about this? Ah, that's the other side, that's the damages. And the idea is that, you, you know, this is a very controversial thing, and we're gonna see later uh, different proposals for it, but, but the simple idea behind is that because of climate change, the output gets damaged. So what you could produce is some, and then what you actually produce is, you know, 5% less, or 10% less, or 20% less, or 30% less, and in catastrophic situations, 20% uh, you know, only 20% or, you know, 10% of what you could be producing. So think of, you know, uh, 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 extreme events that as soon as you produce something, they destroy part of the production or uh, an increase in depreciation for, for what you're producing and so on and so forth. So these are all uh, effects that would be encapsulated by this damage function. So this is, these are the two uh, key things that you need to remember that, uh, you know, capital gets reduced, uh, output gets reduced by abatement and gets reduced by damage. And we're gonna see the last equation that I'm gonna show you is how uh, damages uh, uh, actually uh, work. But now we're gonna work our way from the economics to the climate and eventually the temperature and damage is gonna be a function of the temperature and that's gonna go all the way back to the economics, okay? So that's the only line I want you to memorize. All the other lines are secondary, but in case you are, you are uh, curious, uh, I'm gonna go and say the words because they, they, they help you uh, understand what are the drivers of this thing. So remember I said the firms had profits. So profits are what they sell, what they actually sell, not what they could sell, what they actually sell for a price P, minus what they pay in wages, minus what they pay in interest on debt, minus a carbon tax that it's imposed on them by the government, minus depreciation. That's the profit of the firms. Uh, these are state variables for the model. So this is the wage share. This is the proportion of the total economy that is paid in wages. And typically for an uh, advanced economy, this would be 68, 69, 70%. The rest is paid in profits. Uh, this is a debt share, so it's private debt as a proportion of GDP. Now that varies widely from economy to economy. In the UK is a couple of times GDP. In other economies is a fraction of GDP, 30, 40, 60, 80 percent. So this is, you know, the, when the people say, oh, firms or households are indebted. So how much is that debt as a proportion of GDP? This is this variable. And this is the uh, profit, which is uh, just what's left from, from wages and debt, and actually when it's left from this other thing. So it's just the proportion of profits from GDP. Okay. Why are profits important? Because we are assuming in the model, and there could be more complicated functions, but this is one of the simplifying functions like the bees that I'm saying. We are assuming in the model that uh, firms react to profits by adjusting their investment, and they react in a smooth way. If there are more profits, they're gonna be investing more. If it's less profits, they're gonna be investing less. Okay, just like the B with the temperature. Uh, so investment is a fraction of GDP that is governed by this function kappa, and we're gonna see the types of kappa function that we're gonna use. They're gonna be increasing functions, but, but capped at, at a maximum value because you know, the total production cannot be more than, uh, than GDP, for example. The total investment cannot be more than GDP. Okay, now this is the evolution of capital itself. It goes back to the first diagram I showed you with the limits to growth. Capital increases because you invest minus what you depreciate. So it's investment minus depreciation. Depreciation here has a D because it also gets affected by damage. So capital depreciates faster if there is more damage caused by climate change. 
So this D is that D, is the, is the bold D, is not this D, which is referring to the level of that. I know, there's too many letters. The bold D, the bold face D is damages, the regular D is that. Uh, so how does that evolve? It's like in this uh, table here, what I said. After the firms pay everything and receive everything, they either borrow or not, but typically they do borrow, so typically they increase that. So it's the investment plus what they need to pay in uh, distributed uh, profits. Uh, so this is what they have to pay, this is what they uh, have available to them, uh, and then because they already accounted for profit, for depreciation inside that profit. So anyways, this is just the balancing variable for the, for the firms. Firms typically will borrow to increase their, their uh, investment. And the distributed profits, are, uh, so dividends, are meant to be a, a function of, uh, of total GDP. So we calibrate all those things. And this is inflation. So this is t just uh, how prices evolve. And prices evolve as a lagged adjustment to costs. So, and the only, because this is an aggregate model, the only cost for firms is the final cost, which is the wage cost. So this is a wage price spiral. As wages go up, prices try to catch up to wages, and conversely, firms are paying less in wages, they can afford to reduce prices, okay? So again, it's one of these uh, lagged adjustment variables that follow each other. So wages are gonna come in here in this cost, it's gonna be related to omega, and as omega goes up, prices go up, as omega goes down, prices will go down. Very well. So these are the equations that you end up uh, deducing for for this model, for the state variables, for omega, lambda, which is the employment rate, that D, which is that debt share. Yes, Marco? So, let's go back to what you were saying. So, the bar the D is the relation of the strategy. It's damage, yeah. Correct. So, it's. It's not power, it's a, it's a, sorry, it's not a power. That's a, that's a superscript. That's a superscript. It's because D can be, can, there's gonna be a damage to output and there's gonna be a damage to capital. So there's gonna be D superscript K. Yes, notation is a nightmare. So, but yeah, that's not a power, sorry. <laughs> you see, you all should be asking questions like that. If you were in the back of your mind thinking, why the hell are his damages? exponentiated, you should say it, right? Be, be more like Marco. It's like in the Facebook, you know this person, this person does that and that and that. Be more like that. So all of you be like Marco. Yes? I was thinking about resources that you talked about in the general knowledge. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question, and not yet, but, but we have a way of introducing resources in terms of, yes, this evolution of capital, but, but that's in the works. That's not included here yet. Uh, the interest rate is, uh, in this particular model, is fixed, but in some of my other papers, they can become negative. But you could also put a bound on interest rate. That's fine, too. Uh, you're saying that because you might have heard me talk before about negative interest rates, but that, or not. <laughs> but why are you saying that interest rates can be negative? What was your intuition? I'm coming from ECB country. Very good, very good. Don't, then you haven't seen me talk about that, then that's very good because I have a paper exactly for that, where you allow interest rates to become negative as much as you want, and the model stabilizes because of that. But in practice, they don't. They're too timid. They say, the ECB will say, interest rates cannot go below minus 0.25% uh, or something, right? And that doesn't do anything. That's, that's just like a, 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 a distraction. You should have interest rates to go into minus two if you want to, to have an effect. That's what I show in a different paper. But yes, in principle, interest rates in this type of model could be negative. More of this clarifying questions, I like them. They're my best type of question. Okay, so these three equations here are nothing but the Keen model that I've been talking about for a decade now, and then I worked on many variations of the Keen model with interest rates, with fiscal policy, with this, with that. But now we're gonna use that as the core economic model. So this is what's gonna replace uh, the DSG that uh, Nordhaus uses. So it's gonna replace this type of exponentially increasing uh, subject to shocks. So, uh, 
On the one hand, it's simpler because it's deterministic, but on the other hand, it's much more complex because the deterministic part of the DSG model is an exponential growth. It's just one equation. And they make it complicated by adding these shocks. Here, I have a deterministic core that it's already dynamic and complicated and it's three-dimensional. There's gonna be coupled with many more equations, but the economic thing is three-dimensional. The model I'm gonna show you on uh, Monday, tomorrow, has many more economic dimensions, so it's a deterministically more complex model. And if you want, you can add your shocks to that. But I'm, I'm, I'm concerned to what happens to the economy even before you put the shocks. So many people say, okay, well, well, make that a stochastic. And I say, you make that a stochastic. If you really like that, go ahead and do it. You know, some people have to do the deterministic part first, and that's, that's what I'm doing. But if you really like the stochastic one, go, go ahead and please do, and come and talk to me, and then, and then we collaborate with that. Uh, and I really like when, especially if there's a, an enthusiastic young postdoc preferably Russian in the audience, and they're, they're gonna say, uh, yes, a stochastic version is very easy. I had one like that. And then, and then, and then they go off and say, yeah, you know, I'm gonna produce a stochastic version by Monday. And I said, okay, great. And then we meet on Monday and say, stochastic version is not that easy. <laughs> 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 and then you don't hear from them uh, for, for many, many months. But, but if you want to do that, go ahead and do it. Uh, okay, and this, the only other caveat here is that I introduced a population growth that in previous models was just seen as a constant growth. Here's a logistic equation for population growth because it matches better the UN prediction. So we're gonna see that it, it stabilizes at some uh, level of population by 2050 or something, which is what the UN is, is predicting that is gonna happen, okay? Uh, so that's the economic part. Now, that's a good point to stop because then I can start the climate part after the break and see how it comes together, okay? So, how long? 15 minutes. Okay.